I'd like to begin to explain uh, what I will go through tonight. And I begin to by explaining what's happening around the world that has created the global water crisis. And then I will explain what's happening in Canada that has led to suggest that we needed uh, a new Canadian water act. And in the third part of my presentation, I'd like to explain what we can do as a nation and also as individuals to assure our place at the top of a new wa world water order that's creating itself around water security. And finally, I'd like to just offer some very simple observations on what you can do personally to help bring about a new water ethic in this country. And I want to suggest to you that in traveling here and meeting many of you in the past, I recognize that creating a water ethic is not necessarily something you do have to do here, but the object might be uh, to protect the one you have. As many of you know, and perhaps it's the reason why you're here, the global picture with respect to fresh water is not good. There are trends that are emerging that should properly demand our full attention no matter where we live. And the key point that I want to make is that some of these trends have begun to appear in Canada. And they've begun to appear more widely in Canada than most people recognize. And suddenly we wake up to the fact that some of the things that we're doing here in terms of the way we live and some of the practices that we undertake with respect to the management of water are inadequate. The premise of my presentation is that we should be dealing with emerging problems now while they're smaller in relative terms, while prosperity is on our side, so that as our population grows and our climate changes, our social and economic future is not limited by water availability and quality problems that we could have and we should have addressed in better times. It's well known that our blue globe is defined as a water world. It's recognized by widely, even school children certainly know this, that 97% of the water on this planet is salty, leaving only 3% of it fresh enough to sustain terrestrial life. And of that 3%, much of the world's fresh water is bound in ice or made it inaccessible to us by the depth at which it resides below the surface of the earth. So what we discover is that the same four one thousandths of one percent of the Earth's total water sustains us just as it did every civilization since the beginning of time. And when we look at it historically, we discover also that history is littered with the ruins of societies that have declined simply because they could not overcome the effects of local resource depletion and three to six times the water that exists at any given time in all the world's rivers is now stored behind giant dams. So most of the studies that we see cite population growth as a principal driver in the increased global demand for water. So these projections may be out. And the latest UN figures suggest that our population could be as high as uh, 10 billion by 2050. And these projections invite questions as to whether there will be sufficient water to support population increases of these magnitudes. So if you have 2.9 billion people in the world that are dealing with water scarce situations, you're going to know those people. An additional 5,200 cubic kilometers will be needed annually for agriculture alone by 2050. When you add that up, what you find is it's roughly equivalent to the flow of 100 uh, 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 Columbia rivers. The picture is almost inescapably one of growing demand matched with static or shrinking supplies. We discover there's some real urgency in responding to this important global trend. There's a growing realization, and you see it here too, of nature's need for water, which revolves around growing understanding of how different kinds of ecosystems generate, capture, purify, and release water. So what we've discovered when we look at nature's need for water, and we realize how important it is, as I will explain in a moment, we discover, unfortunately, that full 40% of humanity is now competing directly with nature for water. And as a result, we're beginning to see some very frightening convergences. And I wish you to consider these convergences. If we give nature the water it needs to provide important basic ecological services, then that water will have to come from agriculture, which means people will starve. 
If, on the other hand, we give agriculture the water it needs to keep feeding our growing populations, then there will not be enough water to allow nature to sustain fundamental, long-term, planetary life support function and self-regulation. Water allocation to nature really is not an either-or proposition. We may be approaching a point where humanity's growing need for water will result in widespread environmental decline that may translate into impacts that, in fact, reduce our ability to feed our growing numbers. So then you add to this, Serious groundwater overdraft in many parts of the world, accelerating soil loss in many of the world's most important food producing areas. You add to this widespread contamination that makes water unfit for other uses, often for generations. You add rapidly expanding desertification globally, and the causes and dimensions <coughs> of the global water crisis suddenly become apparent. First of all, here are the things that, of which I'm certain. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are rising rapidly. Despite localized effects of La Nina events and other ocean currents, average global temperatures continue to rise. The warming atmosphere is becoming more turbulent. It's going to take some time to come up there. Okay. Uh, and when the atmosphere becomes more turbulent, what you see is... Uh, more widespread weather pattern disruption, more intense droughts, extreme floods, bigger fires, wild storms all over the world. And maybe you're lucky and that's not happening here, but I can tell you, however, that it's happening elsewhere. Uh, our own Arctic is warming faster than any other place on Earth, and evidence is clearly mounting also as to the causes. The fundamental threat that climate change poses relates to what uh, uh, hydrologists call stationarity, and I want you to see this. Now, Why? what's interesting about this, too, is that hydrologists throughout, uh, particularly the northern hemisphere lately, have observed that stationarity in global hydrological conditions probably never existed, and the reason for that is that climate always changes. Right? And stationarity is the notion that seasonal weather and long-term climate conditions fluctuate within this fixed envelope of relative certainty. What we've done is actually establish our own idea of the range of natural climate variability that we think exists, and then we built our entire society and all our infrastructure that supports that society and all our risk assessments around those numbers. And this mistake in itself, over time, was likely uh, to make us vulnerable. And in the absence of stationarity, risks will become increasingly difficult to predict or to price. And this is the new normal to which our big cities are responding, like Toronto and Calgary and Vancouver. They're all trying to adapt to this. And what we see here is that extraordinary droughts followed by unprecedented flooding in places like Pakistan and Australia suggests that it's really unwise for us to take too isolated a view of what climate change is going to do or mean in the context of hydrological stability. I think in Canada, we still think the effects of climate change will be local, minor, and cumulative, when in fact it, will be not, it won't be long before climate change will be affecting everyone, everywhere, simultaneously compounding every regional economic, social, and political disparity all at once. And the feeling is, is that what we have actually done, quite accidentally, quite unwittingly, unwittingly in fact, is that we've created a hydroclimatic time bomb. A new world order is about to emerge out of the collision between population and economic growth and our planet's rapidly changing hydrology. And where we were once really concerned about peak oil, now we're really concerned about peak water and what water is going to do and where it's going to go. Prosperous countries in the future will be those that have enough water for food, for cities, for industry, and for nature, and that know how to ensure that each gets what it needs. So we face a choice. We can carry on as we have and hope for a silver technological bullet that will solve the manifold array of water-related problems we've created for ourselves, or we can, while we still have time, create and act upon a new narrative, one in which scientific knowledge and technological sophistication are equitably balanced against broader cultural, historical, and environmental value. We also need to fully realize that much of the water that we have is left on the landscape after the last ice age. And that water, as I'm about to show you, is disappearing. And this is of critical importance. And if this current trend persists, 
there's no assurance that the water available to us today will be here for us tomorrow. In the last 20 years, in the Western Mountain National Parks alone, we may have lost as many glaciers as existed a century ago in Glacier National Park in the United States. We probably don't have as much water as we think we do. And we may have less than we have now in some places in the future. And I think we spend way too much time in this country worrying about water exports and not nearly enough time thinking about how changes that are occurring within our hydrological regime should be managed and governed. We've tried to intensify agricultural production so quickly with industrial agricultural techniques that we run into problems with water quality. Agricultural water use is becoming an issue globally because contemporary industrial scale food production practices inevitably result in reduced return flows to nature of water of poor quality, which diminished and often water starved natural aquatic ecosystems no longer have the capacity to purify. Whether acknowledged or not, the central principle of the contemporary water ethic almost universally being practiced in Canada is the primacy of human dominion over water resources. And this ethic is founded upon the widely held but often unexamined belief that water, like all our planet's natural resources, exists to be used at humanity's complete discretion. Nature can't be where we send water only after we've taken all we need for our own purposes. And the ethical implications of this realization are really clear. Unless we want to contribute to our own and to global ecosystem decline. So if we're going to have a new water ethic, what should it be? Well, dozens of important principles have been brought to the fore in answering this question. So in conclusion tonight, I'm only going to offer five. Water ethicists maintain that a partnership ethic where nature is our primary partner is required. And with this relationship, the notions of the greatest good to the greatest number extend membership outward to other species. As, as Carolyn Merchant has so famously argued, sooner or later, fish have to be at and not just on the table. And an ethically based water policy must begin with the premise that all people and all living things have equal rights to enough water to assure their survival before some get more than enough. We seem to think that generating water or recognizing water as a human right is, is so complicated, it's not. Respecting the human right to water involves giving people enough water to have human dignity, to provide enough water that people can afford it and it's accessible to them and the quality is adequate to meet human needs. Now, respect for First Nations water values and rights has to be a starting place, at least, for the creation of a new Canadian water ethic. Because any other approach disavows the history and connection of Indigenous people to the lands and waters across this country. We lack a set of principles, a set of laws, policies, and guidelines. In essence, an ethical framework that stops us from chipping away at natural systems until there's nothing left of their life-sustaining functions, which the marketplace fails to value adequately if it values them at all. We have to fix that. In closing, I'd like to comment on the crucial role of political leadership. We're not going to solve our water problems in Canada without it. And I think it's really important to recognize that we're facing some very difficult trade-offs we're facing the same trade-offs that are occurring elsewhere in the world that we do not wish to recognize. And we should be having the frank discussions and making the hard choices now. Well, time and prosperity are on our side so that as our population grows and our climate changes, our social and economic future is not limited by water problems that we could and should have addressed in better times. Thank you very much.